I think I'm in good company in saying that I think all of us love stories that have happy endings. A good ending where we walk away and say, I'm, I'm glad it turned out that way. We find ourselves pulling for the person who is confronted with what seems to be these insurmountable obstacles, but somehow through their own determined perseverance and persistence and then events that just seem to work in their favor, they are able to overcome. And when we get to the end of it and we see that it worked out for the best for them, we, we rejoice with them, maybe even shed a few joyful tears. I've noticed as I've gotten older, movies that end that way, I just, I just don't keep have the ability not to weep a little bit from that. But that being said, if you listen to what was read just a few moments ago, you know that we have one of those episodes in front of us today. It's, it's a story about an individual who is struggling with something that we have encountered with other people that we know. This is a man who was blind and he desperately wanted to see again. And the Holy Spirit saw fit to have this encounter included in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels for us. Why? Have you ever stopped to say, as you read through the Gospels, do you ask, why was that put there? Why was this story put there? There's a reason. And as we look at it this morning, I hope that I'm able to bring that out or what I think is the reason and what we are able to glean from it in our own lives and what it means to us, removed from that day by almost 2,000 years. You see, it begins with Jesus approaching Jericho. He's been making his way back to Jerusalem. He's got to be in Jerusalem by Passover because he knows what's going to happen. As we, we recognized last week, he is going to be delivered over in the hands of sinful men and there are things that are going to happen and he's going to crucify, be crucified, he's going to die and he's going to rise again on the third day. So he has got to be in Jerusalem and he's been making his way back. As you pass through Jericho, you'll make a westward turn and you'll start up a road that, at least in that day and time, 18 miles away was the city of David known as Jerusalem and that's where he was going. It's a 3,500 foot climb. The road goes up and they're walking. They're making their way to Jerusalem. Now, in Jesus' day, there were actually two, Jer uh, two Jerichos. There was the old city of Jericho, the one that had been destroyed almost 1,400 years earlier as Joshua and the Israelites had come into the promised land and God gave them the city and they destroyed it and burned it with fire. And of course Joshua pronounces a curse over it that anyone who tries to rebuild it, may he lose his firstborn and his secondborn son, which came to play out when a man by the name of Hiel during the days of King Ahaz or Ahab went to do that. But then there was the new city. The new city was about a mile south of the old city. The new city was one that had been built by Herod the Great. It was where he had his winter palace, if you will. It was known as the city of date palms. Beautiful place. And Jesus is coming into this city. He's entering into the city on this occasion. And Luke tells us about someone else who's already there. It's an individual who is a difficult, at a difficult point in his life. And there are two things that I'd like for you to notice that he brings out about this individual. The first is the fact that he's blind. He cannot see. Luke doesn't tell us how long he's been blind. But from what we see later in verse 41, it seems that he had been able to see at one time and then was blinded and now hopes to regain his sight or would like to regain his sight. We're not told at what point in his life he lost his sight, whether it was as a child or later in life. And how much he had seen up to that time. I've often wondered, have you ever thought about which is worse? To be born blind, to never have seen anything, or to have seen things in your lifetime, and then to find yourself blind, and wish that you could see again, missing the things that you had seen at one point in time. 
Many of you may be familiar with the American author, a woman by the name of Helen Keller. Helen Keller was born both blind and deaf. And she was trained in how to speak. One time she was asked, isn't it terrible being blind? I like her response because she said, better to be blind and to see with your heart than to have two good eyes and see nothing. I want you to think about that for just a moment. Better to be blind, see with your heart, than to have two good eyes and see nothing. You see, there is something worse than physical blindness. It's the blindness of the heart. It's spiritual blindness. It's the inability for us to see sin for what it really is. The inability to see the destiny that, is de that we are to inherit if we continue down that path of sin. The inability to see just how lost we are and how hopeless life is if we stay in that state in our lives. That blind man wanted to see. He wanted to see. But the other thing he tells us about us, about this man, and by the name, his, by the way, his name was Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, which just means the same thing. It's just repetition because Bar in the Hebrew means son of. Timaeus was the name of his father, Bar Timaeus, and Timaeus is a name that means honor, son of honor. He wanted to see, but he was living a life, and the only way he could survive was by begging. I don't know that any of us in this room could truly understand what life must have been like for him. I dare say that none of us have ever had to beg for anything in our lives. Unless maybe as a small child we wanted something very badly and we just begged a parent over and over again for it. Please buy this, please buy this for me. But other than that, we have never had to live a life begging for things. What was it like for him? He would get up, and get up in the morning, no telling. We don't know where he may have slept, where he may have stayed, gather what little possessions he had together, pick up his walking stick, and start out down the road for his usual place where he would sit and beg. And as he is tapping his way along, I imagine in the morning he knew different people that were kind to him or would be kind to him. And so he might ask somebody standing in the doorway of their house or their shop, do you have a few scraps today? Anything left over from breakfast? I, 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 I'm really hungry this morning. Can you spare just a few crumbs? He knew the people that would be kind to him. And so I'm sure that he would ask them and they would give them what they could. But when he reached his spot... He would sit down and he would listen, no doubt, as people passed by and, and take in the things that they were saying. And as they are continuing along, I dare say that throughout the day he would ask them, somebody he hears going by, could you spare me a little bit today? Have you got anything for a poor man? Please, please. This was his life. Every day. And it would be his life, as far as he knew, till he was no more. Try to put yourself for just a moment in his predicament. What would you do? How would you survive? You would be totally dependent upon the kindness of others. Because people can be cruel to those who struggle as he struggled taking advantage of his blindness. He was hoping that more people would be kind than would be cruel. But you know, one thing I have to believe about him is that he recognized every sound. He knew everything that was going on around him because you tend to pick up on those things. He could probably have told you, uh, that's an ox cart going by. I can tell by the sound of the hooves. Or no, that's a donkey pulling that cart. It just There's a distinction there. Or though there's a camel coming. Really? Yeah, I hear it. It's coming down. I, I never mistake that clock as it comes by. 
He probably listened to the women as they were on their way to the market to buy goods for that day or on their way to the well to get water and they're talking about what's going on in their families. No doubt he listened to the men who were making their way to Jerusalem or somewhere in town and he would pick up little bits of information about what's going on around him and in the community and even in Jerusalem. What was happening at that time was that the Feast of Passover was near, wasn't far ahead. And people, pilgrims, were making their way down. One of the main routes was to come through Jericho and make your way into Jerusalem. And as the people were coming by, he would listen to their, the crowds as they were making their way to the city of David for that holy event. And always there was some excitement in the air, and no doubt he's hoping that because of the time of the year, people would be a little more generous and a little more willing to do for him than they might have been when things were different. And so he's asking and pleading and asking for food. But there's something different about today. His ears pick it up. The crowd seems to be a little more excited. There seems to be a few more people gathered around and and making their way through town than what he's normally used to hearing. And so he finally asks someone, what's going on? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. No doubt he had heard that name before. Maybe he had heard it from people that had seen him heal, watched him as he had fed thousands, listened to his sermons. Maybe he had even heard it from somebody, a first-person account, from an individual who had been healed and could tell him what it was like when Jesus healed me. And so he knew, he knew that if he was ever to be healed, Today was his opportunity. Today was the day he had to do it. I said he was blind. But I want you to know that he could see something that others could not see. He had a sight that others missed out on. What I mean by that is others saw only a miracle-working teacher who hailed from a little city known as Nazareth. One that at one time Nathaniel had said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Bartimaeus, he saw much more. He saw something that others missed. This is God's anointed one. This is the promised Messiah. This is the son of David. Notice that title. It's not used anywhere else in all of Luke's gospel. Son of David. On the lips of this beggar, son of David. And that title, that term, goes back a thousand years to the days of David and also of his son Solomon. And the promise that was made in those days. Because if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 9 with the the, the dedication of the temple and the prayer that Solomon has prayed. And what you find there is that God responds to Solomon. And there's something that God says to Solomon all those years ago. And what he says to him is, he says, If you will walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and righteousness, doing according to all that I commanded you, and will keep my statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. Just as I promised your father David, saying, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel, son of David. But you come forward a few hundred years and there's a prophet, a man by the name of Isaiah. And Isaiah had issued a similar prophecy, one that we find in chapter 9 of his work there in verses 6 and 7. And here's what he says. He says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government of, or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You see, Bartimaeus saw, not only is this the son of David, he has the right lineage, he's also the Son of God. If you go back 
in Luke's gospel to the beginning of this gospel. And what you find there, if you go back to chapter 1, the, the angel Gabriel has appeared to Mary to tell her that she is about to, be, to conceive through the seed that the Holy Spirit will implant within her and she is to give birth to a son and she is to call the name of that child Jesus. And then in verse 2, he makes a statement to her. He says, he will be great and will be called Son of the Most High God. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David. Bartimaeus has put it all together. Bartimaeus knows who this person is. And he knows if I'm going to be healed, it is going to be through this son of David, this anointed one, this Messiah that we have waited for. And so he can't get to Jesus because of the crowd. But he can call out. And that's exactly what he does. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Do you remember the plea of the tax collector that we looked at just a few weeks ago who went up to the temple to pray? He stood afar off, beat his chest, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. And what did he say? He cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And if you go back beyond that to chapter 17, there's another individual that does the same thing. Actually, individuals, I should say. There between Galilee and Samaria, ten lepers that Jesus encountered. And what are they crying out as Jesus passes through their, their village? Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Mercy. Something that Paul in his letter to the Ephesians said that God is rich in. He's rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loves us. And that's what Bartimaeus was asking for that day. Mercy. And do you realize that's what every single one of us in this room need from God? Mercy. Like the infants, we have nothing that we can bring to God to say, I'm worthy of you redeeming me. We have no accolades that we can say, see all that I've done in my life, I think I'm worthy for you to notice me. No, we're like the tax collector, we're like the lepers, we're like this man who is blind, and we too cry out, Lord, have mercy on my soul. Please forgive. And that's exactly what he was doing. What does the crowd say? They don't have time for him. Their response is harsh. They sternly rebuke him. And Luke doesn't tell us the words we can only begin to imagine. As the ones who are leading, they're kind of ahead of Jesus. And they're hearing him call out, Jesus, have mercy on me. John, son of David, have mercy on me. They're saying, be quiet. He doesn't have time for you. Shut up! Have you ever had somebody tell you to shut up? Doesn't fit well, does it? But they're telling him that. Is that what he does? Does he shut up and just shrink back and continue to beg for food? No. He continues to call out even more. As a matter of fact, Luke changes his wording. Where it, originally he was using a word that means to shout out. Now he uses another word. It is a word that in the Greek literally means to cry, to scream out. And that's what he does. Luke says crying out all the more because he wants to have his sight restored to his blind eyes. And so he cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And he won't quit. He won't quit. No matter how much people are telling him, be quiet, quit, shut up. And Jesus stops. Luke doesn't say this. You have to go to Mark's gospel. Luke just tells us he commanded, Jesus commanded for him to be brought to him. In Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter 10, verses 49 and 50, he says, he stopped and he said, Jesus said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage. Stand up. He's calling for you. And Mark gives us his response. Throwing aside his cloak, he just throws it off. He jumps up. Remember, he's blind. He, he, he knows where the voice is coming from. He knows the general direction, but I'm sure there were those that suddenly their tenor had changed so that they guided him to Jesus. 
And when he got to Jesus, Jesus asked him a question. He said, what do you want me to do for you? Let me ask you a question today. If you were standing in front of our Lord, what would you say to him? If he looked you in the eyes and said, what do you want me to do for you? Would you be so bold as to say, I'm really pretty good. I don't know that I need anything. Thank you, though, for offering. Or would you say, I need everything you will give me. I need your mercy. I need your grace. I need your love. I need your guidance. I need your encouragement. I need it all. Bartimaeus knew exactly what it was that he wanted. He had no compunction there not to express it. He said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. I want to see again. I had the privilege to go to Israel in 2000. And I can tell you one of the prettiest sights I saw while I was over there was a sunrise across the Sea of Galilee. I can imagine he'd like to see that. Or maybe he would like to see the beautiful temple in Jerusalem to see just how glorious it was. To see Passover for the first time and all of the pilgrims growing up, going up for Passover and, and, and to be a part of that great pilgrimage and to hear the rejoicing and to see the people as they're making their way toward the great city of David. Or maybe just to see the faces of his loved ones for the first time again, not having seen them in who knows how long. If you were in his shoes, what would you want to see? Can't begin to imagine what it must have been like for him. But I want you to consider this. When Jesus began to speak, he was blind. When Jesus finished speaking, he could see. Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. There was no surgery, no follow-up. No minor surgeries to correct anything that needed to be corrected. All Jesus had to say was, receive your sight. There's no indication he laid his hands on him. No indication he spit in and put spittle on his eyes or put mud on it or anything else. He just said, receive your sight. And suddenly he could see. What was the first thing he saw? I want to suggest to you that the first thing he saw was the face of his Lord. That's the first thing he saw. When this life is over and you lay eyes on a new realm, what will be the first thing you would want to see? Have you thought about that? I want to see the one who gave his life for me. I want to see him in all his glory. I don't know what I'll do, but I want to see him. Your faith has made you well. His faith in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, his faith that God's only son could set him free from those years of darkness. Wouldn't you like to have been a part of the crowd that day just, just to see all of this, to see his excitement over suddenly having received his sight, to see him glorifying God and following Jesus. I want to go up with you to Jerusalem. Let's go. To be a part of that jubilant crowd that joined him on that day. There are three things I want to leave you with this morning. Something that you and I, I think, are need, need to learn from this encounter. It's this. Each one of us needs to be able to see our own need. Bartimaeus knew he was blind. 
He knew that he wanted to see. The sad thing about blindness is it, it does it. The fit is, spiritual blindness keeps us from seeing the things that we need to see, our own sin, and where that sin is going to lead us, and the loneliness it's going to leave within us, and the darkness that is going to be ours. But we need to be able to see that we need someone beyond us to save us, to change us, to make us whole again. And I want you to know, every one of you here this morning, that you're not alone because every single one of us in this room have fallen short of God's glory because of our sin. And were it not for Jesus Christ, we would still be in our same predicament. And so we need to see that sin. But secondly, we need to see Jesus for who He is. He is exactly who He professed Himself to be. He's the good shepherd. He is the way to the Father. He is the Savior who alone can save us. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is, I love the way John even starts his gospel, he is the true light in whom there is no darkness. We need to see him for that. But the third thing that I want to leave you with this morning is we need to come to him not only do we need to see our need, but see the one who meets that need and see that without going to the one who meets our need, we are just as lost as we ever were. We've got to make the decision to come to him in our lives. We can't keep going on like we always had. Bartimaeus did not want to stay blind. Bartimaeus did not want to go every day and sit down and keep begging for food. Bartimaeus wanted a different life. And he was willing to do whatever it took to have that life. No matter how embarrassing, no matter what somebody else said to him. So the question for each one of us this morning, because he asks us, he calls to us to come. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, is will I get up and will I go toward him? Will I respond to his call to me? Knowing that he has become to every one of us who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Is that what you need in your life this morning? Eternal salvation. It's found in only one place in the blood of Christ through which we come in contact in our baptism through our faith in what he's done if you need to respond to that invitation that he extends to you won't you come right now as together we stand and sing